Okay, it's Stephen Sen here. I'm a statistician, a semi-retired, and I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. So what happened in 1976? It's an important year. The USA was 200 years old. Jimmy Carter was president. Apple Computer Company and Microsoft were incorporated, and I got married. So 1976 is an important year for me. Uh, and in fact, I got married in the chapel at Greenwich Naval College, which is rather grand, rather an overwhelming occasion, and one that is certainly seared in my mind. But Eugene Glass proposed the term meta-analysis for the combination of study results. Meta-analysis states that it's about as old as my marriage. It goes back nearly 50 years, but no further than that. But that's not quite correct. So this is what I'm going to talk about uh, in my lecture, Glass 1976, and how the roots of the combination of observations, which is really what meta-analysis is about, uh, go back further to the late 18th and early 19th century, and in particular in the science of astronomy. I'm going to introduce you to two books on a combination of observations, one by Airy, Astronomy, which is a 19th century book, and one by Brunt on Astronomy and Meteorology, which is an early 20th century book. Then say something about what happened in agriculture, about metronome, and what has happened and is happening in medicine, and then give you some conclusions. So on with Glass's paper of uh, 1976. So um, just a quote from him, he says, my major interest currently is in what we have come to call, not for want of a less pretentious name, the meta-analysis of research. And he then justifies this name. I'm not so sure that the name was in particular very logical, but never mind. Um, it's, uh, for me, it would be more appropriate if one were looking at some basic underlying methodological issues of some particular subject. But actually, for the combination of evidence per se, I'm not sure it's the correct term to use. Anyway, be that as it may, it's here to stay. It's the term we, term we use. It's the most common term nowadays used for the synthesis of research results. And in fact, the paper has been a pretty big hit, or at least if not directly cited, then you will find that uh, large numbers of papers are now published every year with meta-analysis as a topic. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, a, a plot showing um, that uh, nowadays we're at about 50,000 papers a year on this particular topic. And the right-hand plot uses a logarithmic scale to show that indeed the uh, citation rate is uh, exponential and it shows no sign really of dropping off. The, fact, the reason that the very last point drops down is simply because the, uh, the web of science hasn't caught up yet with the citations. So it's been a big hit. Uh, and on the right hand side there, you can see some particular subjects in which meta-analysis appears now. Um, this is by analysis by subject to end 2023. Um, you'll find mathematics is down there as one of the subjects. I don't imagine that people are using meta-analysis to combine results in mathematics. This is what one person says is the root of a quadratic. And this is what another person says, well, in the two and see if that's a reasonable solution. I imagine that what it means is that some sort of methodological research into meta-analysis is being done. That is what maybe what one might call true meta-meta-analysis. So Glass's technical innovation, however, was not just a term. He provided a means of combining studies that did not always use the same endpoint. This has been referred to by me in a particular paper, the many modes of meta as being a type C meta-analysis. Type A is when you have the original data, Type B is when you have summaries, but the same outcome measure. And type C is the desperate case when you're trying to combine things where people didn't actually use the same measurements. This has been less copied. Um, and you'll find that to the extent that researchers are combining studies with the same endpoint, they're going back to a much earlier tradition. And that particular tradition did not start in educational research. Uh, Glass claimed to be really involved in educational research, but I think he was, as much as anything, really looking at psychotherapy but in physics, in particular astronomy. So just briefly to tell you what Glass did, I'm sure many are familiar with this, basically doing was that you could use a sigma divided measure. You could measure the difference between the average value in the treatment group and the average value in the control group by the standard deviation. And that produced a sort of unit free measure. And then you could take a leap of faith and you could say, well, I've got one unit free measure here. I've got another unit free measure there originally they weren't measuring the same thing but maybe they can be combined in some particular way and then a particular theory for weighting this was developed you can always also look at the uh, the overlap in terms of the probability that a randomly sampled individual from one group would have a higher value than a randomly sampled individual in another group 
And that's what the graph on the right hand side is supposed to show. But as I claim, in fact, uh, what we do nowadays mainly is we don't do that. Mainly in medicine, certainly we're in the fortunate situation that we do have a number of studies in which the same endpoint has been used. And we don't usually opt for using a sigma divided measure, but we tend to use combination on the original scale of measurement. And to the extent that we're doing that, we are in fact using techniques that were developed already by the beginning of the 19th century. This is a timeline of Egon Pearson's in his 1990 biography of student, in which he considers various important innovations in thinking about using data to say, say things about the world. And he starts with Thomas Bayes's posthumous publication on inverse probability from 1764, and then with Pierre Simon Laplace's uh, later investigation of essentially the same field, and then mentions Carl Friedrich Gauss's origin uh, original paper on these squares of 1809 uh, and then papers by Laplace one that I was not aware of until I went back to uh, Pearson's book was this essay on probability by the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge which was essentially a society devoted to try and give uh, <clears throat> less well-off people in Britain some sort of an idea as to what was happening in the world of science and so forth and uh, this was published anonymously, we now know, by Lubbock and Drinkwater. Lubbock and Drinkwater were the authors. De Morgan, a famous name in logic. Those of you that are familiar with logic will know of De Morgan's laws. Um, <clears throat> and he was rather a scathing critic of uh, the general trend towards inverse probability and someone certainly who influenced R.A. Fisher in his thinking on the subject. Herschel, the astronomer, the British astronomer, gave an alternative derivation of the law of errors in 1850 and Boole, another one who challenged inverse probability in his Laws of Thought book from 1854. Missing but major from a Pearson's list is Adrian Legendre, who tends to be overlooked. But in Stephen Stiegler's wonderful book on the uh, history of the measurements of uncertainty, <clears throat> then in that case, he figures prominently as being an important figure. And I was interested to note that when I looked at Whitaker and Robinson, yet another book on the combination of observations, the calculus of observations that went into several editions, then they actually quote Legendre as being a major figure, but he tends to be overlooked in the history of this. Well, what I want to really bring to your attention are two books on the combination of, uh, of observations, one by Airy and the other by Brunt. So George Biddle Airy was Astronomer Royal from 1835. And in 1866, he published a book um, on the combination of er uh, errors, in fact, the algebraical and numerical theory of errors of observation and the combination of observations. And this book was well known to many of the characters in this story. For example, Student in his correspondence with R.A. Fisher uh, mentions it, it was a, they would go back to it to see you know, what it had to say about how you should combine observations. And it really has two important principles. And these are they. First, the combination weight for each measure ought to be proportional to its theoretical weight. And second, when the combination weight for each measure is proportional to its theoretical weight, the theoretical weight of the final result is equal to the sum of the theoretical weights of the several collateral measures. How can we express this? Basically, in terms of the way in which we do Bayesian updating. Uh, if you have, for example, a certain amount of prior information, which might be subjective or it might be based on previous studies, and this particular, you have an estimate, and this particular estimate has a precision, which will be uh, the reciprocal of the variance here. And you also have a, a data estimate, a more current estimate, which has arisen from the study you've just done, and that has some precision. Then what Airy says is the way you should combine them is that you weight each by their precision, you divide by the sum of the precision, you provide a weighted average using the precision, the inverse of the variance. And the precision that you then obtain is equal to the sum of the precisions. And this is exactly the formula that we use nowadays for Bayesian updating. And also, if we have, instead of a prior probability, we just have, pro we just have estimates from different studies. And in fact, what we're doing is we're combining the studies using this particular weight when we do a fixed effect meta-analysis. This is essentially the formula for modern fixed effect meta-analysis, and it dates back to the middle of the 19th century. Now, David Brunt, um, born in 1886, was actually born into a Welsh-speaking family in Montgomeryshire, and he didn't learn English until the age of 10. But on starting in an English school, he very rapidly became <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the outstanding pupil of that school. And he went on to study mathematics at Cambridge, which was the university where all serious mathematicians went. 
uh, <coughs> at the beginning of the 20th century at Trinity College. He was interested in astronomy, but during World War I, when he enlisted, he became involved in meteorology, that's to say, with weather forecasting. And he worked in the meteorological office and was later a professor of meteorology at Imperial College London. At that time, the only such department in uh, the United Kingdom. And his, he produced a book, published a book during the First World War, The Combination of Observations. And it's a thorough treatment of the theory of least squares as it was understood in 1917. However, the second edition by 1931, as I shall explain, was already outdated. So these are the chapters that you'll find in both editions of the combination of observations. Basically, all he did in the second edition is work further on chapters 11 and 12, harmonic analysis from the standpoint of least squares, what we would probably now call Fourier analysis, and the periodogram, both topics in which he was particularly an expert because he was used to having a look at trying to find uh, seasonal patterns in weather to help with forecasting. Um, but what we're particularly concerned with here are the first four chapters. Uh, in book, chapter one, he describes the error observation. Chapter two, he derives the law of error, which we call the normal distribution. Uh, in chapter three, he considers the case of one unknown, essentially estimating a mean. Um, but there he assumes all the observations of equal weight. And then in chapter four, he introduces the idea of observations which might have different weight, weighted according to precision, which might be established subjectively in some particular way. You might think, I think this observation is more reliable than that one in some way, or it might be established using standard errors, which could be estimated from the particular observations that are being combined. The rest of the uh, book is of less interest here as regards this talk, although chapter eight, the rejection of observations, and chapter nine, alternatives of the normal law of error, are still topics which concern us today. So if we have a look at the two observations, the two uh, editions, what changes? Well, hardly anything changes here. Here I've given you per chapter. You can see the chapters are almost of equal length. That doesn't mean that they're absolutely identical. Occasionally he does some rearrangement and the occasionally he changes a particular reference that he gave. Um, but really it's only in the latter part of the book that he starts adding new material. So the interesting thing is that neither edition cites students' 1908 paper. I think that's just about excusable in 1917. Uh, students' paper is already nine years old by then, but it had really made little impact for various reasons that we'll discuss. But he had no solution for the probably problem of uncertainty in the estimate of the variance. Basically, he proceeds as if the variance is unknown. In other words, as if you can use uh, a normal distribution. You Essentially, you can treat them as if they're known parameters. You can treat them um, from the point of view of weighting as if they're known parameters, which we know is not quite right. But also in particular for the that in probable errors, you can use the normal distribution, which was unknown to him in 1917 and still unknown in 1931. So this is an extract from the book, uh, The Combination of Observations. I'll spend a little time having a look at one of the examples here. And this particular example says, given the following six determinations of the parallax of the star Lalande 21185, find the weighted mean and its probable error. So he proposes here some weights uh, without really explaining what the weights are. He just says that these are the weights we're going to use and he then proceeds to illustrate how we will calculate this. Uh, by the way, I'm just highlighting here um, what he uses to calculate the probable error. Scientists in that particular era didn't tend to use standard errors as we use them now. They tended to use a multiple of the standard, what we now call the standard error, which essentially had the property that if you added it and subtracted it to the mean, then if you use the inverse probability argument, the true value would lie with 50% probability in the particular region that you had. It was a sort of cut point of the normal distribution corresponding to 25% and 75%. And that is to three decimal places, I'm trying to read it here, 0.674, four decimal places, 0.6745, so that's really pretty accurate. I'll come back to exactly what he imagined he was doing when he did that. So here I've done a MathCAD reproduction of uh, Blunt's calculations. He starts out with the parallax value. He then actually, I think what he does is, I missed something off here. Let's see. He actually recodes this. Yes, x equals parallax minus 0.4 times 10 to the 3. You youngsters won't know what this is, but statisticians of my generation had to learn this we actually used to have to do calculations, not only without a computer, but without a pocket calculator. 
And that meant that you used to reduce observations into forms that were easy to handle. So you would take some arbitrary origin, which made the numbers small. They didn't want to be dealing with big numbers if they were all similar big numbers, especially when you're calculating a variance. And then you would get rid of decimal, decimal points, for example, by multiplying by a thousand, which is what he's done here. So using this arbitrary origin, he then proceeds to go and weight these particular observations. Uh, he simply multiplies the parallax by the weight. The weight here is his subjective uh, estimate of precision here to get the product Px. And he then also calculates uh, a weighted mean doing this. And then what does he do? Oh, yes, he calculates the deviations from the mean. That's the thing which he's labeled V. He calculates the square of these deviations, and then he has to weight these as well in order to produce a standard error. I think I'll skip over all of this. Um, but just to say that at the very, very end, when he comes to calculate the uh, variability, although he's been waiting as if this was a fixed effect meta-analysis, He's actually using the extent to which the individual estimates themselves differ from the overall mean to estimate the variability. So he's actually using a between studies sum of squares. He's actually using a random effect meta-analysis. And the degrees of freedom that he has, I think, are one, two, three, four, five. So uh, if I put the calculations together, I get exactly the same table as him. That's good. But the multiplier that applies for five degrees of freedom is not 0. 0.6745 to uh, four decimal places. I've said here 0. 0.675 would apply to 250 degrees of freedom. But to get it to 6, 2.6745, you would have to have 4,000 degrees of freedom to justify that degree of precision in the actual multiplier. And really, for five degrees of freedom, the value is 0.726. So he's about eight in the value of the multiplier here, but he's completely unaware of students' work. So in summary for Brunt, the weights are the same way that Airy does. He weights as if it was a fixed effect estimator, but he calculates the probable error between studies as in a random effects estimator, and he assumes normality, no concepts of degrees of freedom. As regards point two, he does say that sometimes one could use possibly the standard errors that you've calculated for the individual observations as a means of establishing what the reliability is of the weighted sum overall. But he says on the whole, this is not a very good method to use. So he doesn't particularly like that. But he doesn't go one further and then actually consider, well, maybe I shouldn't be weighting things this way in the first place anyway. If you look at his citations, then he's well aware of a long tradition in astronomy stretching back to Gauss and Laplace. But curiously, he does not cite Airy's book. He doesn't cite Airy's book, despite the fact that he acknowledges the help of Stratton, who was a major figure who taught <coughs> Fisher at Keyes and was mentioned in conversation by student and <coughs> Fisher, and who brought Fisher into contact with students, a sort of middleman there, who was well known to lecture on the combination of observations. And as far as I know, he used Airy's book to do this. So Brunt doesn't mention it, don't know why. He does mention Airy, uh, another paper of Airy's, but he doesn't mention Airy's book. He's unaware of what Student and then Fisher did for small samples, as I say, that's forgivable in 1917, but outdated by 1931. So what was happening in agriculture? This is a sort of timeline of statistics and computing um, that I occasionally use, starting with, uh, for the 20th century, starting with Student's t-test in 1908. 1918, Fisher proposes the use of variance uh, and in 1919, starts work at Rothamsted. And his book, Statistical Methods for Research Workers, by which time he'd sorted out the modern way of presenting the t-distribution student, didn't in fact calculate this t-statistic the way we do it now. It's a multiple of the current uh, t-distribution. Uh, Fisher did it in a way which has the nice property that as the degrees of freedom increase, it actually converges on the standard normal. This is not the case for Stevens' version. Uh, 1928 was the first of Neyman and Pearson's papers together. In 1935, Fisher published the, the design of experiments. And in 1937, Yates, his algorithm for factorial experiments. So things were moving really fast in agriculture. In computing, then Conrad Zuss produces the first programmable electric computer or produced it in 1941, working in Germany. 1957, Fortran released. When I did my PhD, um, well, even when I was an undergraduate at university, I occasionally had access to a computer and what we programmed was, uh, was Fortran. 
using a Canadian version of it, using the Watt4 compiler, which is Waterloo Fortran. Uh, in 1965, Nelda proposed the theory of general balance, which essentially is a front end algorithm, which often misunderstood people think that it's, a, it's an estimation algorithm. It's also that, but it's primarily a front end algorithm, which will tell you once you define how your experiment was designed, exactly how it should be analyzed. As far as I'm aware, no other package apart from GenStat does this. People always say to me, oh, yeah, but in SAS or yeah, but in R and so on and so forth. And I point out to them, the package is not doing that. Your brain is doing that. And you're then fiddling about with the model statements in order to get it right. GenStat, the package is doing it for you. It actually tells you once you define the block and the treatment structure and you tell it what the design matrix is, it builds the model exactly from that information. So 1977, the International Association for Statistical Computing founded. 1979, we have the Efron Bootstrap. So that's uh, sort of the start, if you like, of uh, high volume computing. 1989, Gail Fand and Smith. I always think it's ironical that this great paper should have been the way that Bayesians came to love objective probabilities after all. Because what on earth is one doing with MCMC apart from estimating probabilities using relative frequencies of random numbers. And 1995 was the beginning of R. So going back to the start of that, William Seeley Gossett, born Canterbury 1876, published under the, the pen name Student, was educated in uh, Winchester and Oxford. He had a first in mathematical moderations in 1897 at uh, Oxford, but then switched to chemistry and I think might have regarded himself as being a chemist rather than a mathematician. Started with Guinness in 1899 in Dublin, and in the autumn of 1906, was given permission to go and study with Carl Pearson at UCL. And out of that particular period, that sabbatical, if you like, came a number of papers, in particular, the probal error of a mean. And it was the first method available, or so we used to think, to judge significance in small samples. But in actual fact, we now know that inevitably, a German had already done it. So Gossett was anticip anticipated by Jakob Lourdes in 1876. Um, but we can say of Gossett that he developed the t-test independently and he used it regularly in his work. I'm not sure whether Lourdes actually ever used his own method, particularly in the work that he subsequently did. Stratton put him in touch with Fisher, uh, a, tutor, a tutor at Keyes, where F Fisher was when he was at Cambridge. And some years later, a letter from Isidore Grinwald informed Fisher that the data he copied from student and which were used in statistical methods for research work had been mislabeled. So the irony of all of this is that uh, although students and Fisher had got the most up-to-date methods available for the analysis of this, and in fact, students' um, example from his paper appeared in Fisher's book uh, for all of its editions described as if it was about optical isomers, um, and it was only then that they discovered they had the wrong data. So there's a lesson here, and that is that having the, the right data is probably even more important than having the right analysis. In shortly after student's paper, there was uh, a paper published by Wood and Stratton in which they introduced the idea of applying standard errors to agriculture. Until then, standard errors, or at least um, probable errors, were the sort of thing that astronomers were used to calculating, but agricultural scientists, I didn't think, have much use for it. Uh, but Wood and Stratton, Wood was an agricultural scientist and Stratton was a friend of his who was an astronomer, saw a similarity, and this is how to describe it. A moment's consideration will show that they have one point in common, the two sciences of agriculture and astronomy. The astro they are both at the mercy of the weather. The astronomer's measurements come short of absolute accuracy because of the great number of varying atmospheric conditions, each of which is equally likely to make any one result high or low. He has to obviate this unavoidable lack of accuracy by making many independent observations and taking their average. This is or should be the method followed by the agriculture. So agriculture, however, was soon to have recruit an absolute star in statistics. And this was R.A. Fisher, who arrived in Rothamsted in uh, 1919. He studied Cambridge at Keyes, where Stratton was his tutor, tutor. And he's as famous, I would say, as a geneticist, or almost as famous as a statistician. He was professor at genetics at University College, London and Cambridge, but actually never held a chair in statistics. And Richard Dawkins has referred to him as the greatest of Darwin's successors in the blind watchmaker. Uh, Fisher actually developed students' small t-test to apply to two samples, students that only use it for one, and also for regression problems. And he generalized the approach to deal with more than two treatments, more than one level of variation, and linked the parametric approaches based on the normal distribution of symmetries 
induced by or calling for random. I think this is a very particularly beautiful part of, of uh, perhaps unexpected, but maybe in retrospect, perfectly reasonable part of Fisher's theory is that you can really produce very, very similar results just by using the randomization distribution rather than imagining that you're sampling from some similar normal. He stressed not just point estimation, but also valid estimates of error. Now, Frank Yates um, was Fisher's deputy at Rothamsted and succeeded him when Fisher left. And he made many important contributions to the design and analysis experiments, in particular factorial experiments, incomplete block design, covering into block information, all of which in a sense, I think, um, are important for medical statistics, but underused. We don't know enough about these particular things, in my opinion. This is what David Finney had to say on Yates' death regarding his work. In 1939, war broke grave anxieties about British food supplies. Rotham said had been in the far, fore in crop research for a century, but Frank realized how little had been done to collate all evidence on the scope of increasing food production in a country depending largely on imports. The submarine menace raised questions about the balance between importing food and importing fertilizers. Frank initiated one of the earliest exercises in what today is fashionable as meta-analysis. Using the resources of Rothamsted's fine library and with many voluntary helpers, he attracted information, he abstracted information on yields, increases associated with each of the main fertilizer elements, sodium, potassium, uh, sorry, sodium, phosphate, and potassium, uh, as evidenced by um, experiments of all major crops. A final report, Crowther and Yates, rested on data from perhaps 5,000 experiments. So um, returning to one of uh, Frank Yates's uh, other interests, incomplete randomized blocks, this again is a citation of his paper, not really reached the same impact as uh, Eugene Glass did with meta-analysis, but still rather important and it's relevant to network meta-analysis. Network meta-analysis has many of the same features as randomized block designs, apart from the fact that really one doesn't randomize between studies, one only randomizes within them. So in a paper in 1938 in agricultural science, Yates and Cochran had addressed the issue of combining um, experimental results. And I think this is well worth a, worth a read. There are lots of acute insights, which I think uh, we could still benefit from today. Um, this is one of them. It's usually impossible to secure a set of sites selected, selected entirely at random. In other words, abandon the idea that you are somehow randomly sampling when you're doing an experiment. But, they say, the deliberate inclusion of sites representing extreme conditions may be of value. If you really want to say something useful about clay soils and sandy soils, then what you want to do is to study clay soils and sandy soils, two extremes, rather than imagining that what you want to do is you want to have a random sample of fields from across the United Kingdom in order to learn about this. Lack of randomness is then only harmful insofar as it results in the emission of certain types and in the consequent arbitrary restriction of the range of conditions. In this respect, scientific research is easier than technical research. It's a rather odd thing to make, but I understand it like this. What, they say, what they're saying is the following. If you want to see whether, for example, um, potassium, oh, I think the N was nitrate, sorry. Well, if you want to know that um, potassium makes a difference or not in, uh, in the particular yield of a, um, of a soil or any particular fertilizer, uh, then in that case, just restricting attention to a particular field is enough. If you find there's an effect in that field, then you've shown there is an effect. If you want to know what the effect will be in general when applied outside, then you're engaging in technical research, and that is much more difficult. And this is what they have to say about treatment interactions. If the mean square for varieties is significant, this indicates the significance of the average differences of the varieties over the particular set of places chosen. A similar analogy would be a fixed effect meta-analysis tells you that the treatments, if the result is significant, and we accept significance as being a valid indicator of an effect, it tells you that for the patient studied, there was a difference between the two treatments. If variety of time place is also significant, it is clear that the choice of place must affect the magnitude of the average difference between varieties. But even if variety of time place is not significant, this fact cannot be taken as indicating no variation in the varietal differences. Again, translated, to meta-analysis for medicine, if there's a trial by treatment interaction, it indicates that the treatment effect varies from circumstance to circumstance. However, 
even if you haven't found evidence of this in the particular studies that you've conducted, it doesn't guarantee that there can be no variation of the treatment effect elsewhere when studied under different circumstances. So what they cover is fixed effect estimation, equal weighting. In their case, many of the experiments would have similar precision. They were carried out in fields of similar sizes. They were fairly well standardized. So they could recommend equal weighting. Weighting by observed precision, they also cover, but they, they point out the dangers of this and they, they cover the maximum likelihood to estimate when the variances are known. There are problems when the variances increase with the means and they consider this as well. They look at site by treatment interactions. They look at random effect estimators. They look at the relationship between mean yields and effects. And the Rotham said school really was, in my opinion, uh, a very, very important contributor to a particular school of statistical inference, which we may even collect these days. These are three of the, the figures that I've mentioned. Fisher, who worked on variance, ANOVA, randomization, design, and significance tests. Frank Yates on factorials, recovering into block information. And John Nelder on general balance, computing in general and GenStat. Of course, we also know him for generalized linear models. What happened and is happening in medicine? Well, this is a way in which agricultural research differs from medical research. In agriculture, the degrees of freedom for estimating error are usually scarce. For medicine, they're usually abundant. We usually have many, many degrees of freedom, certainly in phase three clinical trials, you'll have many. Um, whereas if you're running a typical agricultural experiment, let's say the sort of thing Fisher was used to looking at, you have a five by five Latin square, that means five rows, five columns, five treatments. I don't know what that gives you, maybe 12 degrees of freedom to estimate the variation but certainly you can't do it uh, treatment by treatment. In a clinical trial, if you have three arms in a clinical trial, we still have the habit of pooling the variances across the three arms, even when we're only comparing two of them, and there's probably no justification for that whatsoever. Experiments of similar size in medicine are different sizes, many treatments per trial in agriculture, few treatments per trial in medicine. There's a complex treatment structure in agriculture, and it would vary with different levels of the blocking structure, usually simple treatment structure for medicine. The process of measurement is relatively easy for agriculture and it's extremely difficult for medicine. And there are problems in particular to do with ethics and missing values. And here's another important difference as Michael Healy said, the difference between agricultural and medical research is that agricultural research is not done by farmers. But some similarities, variability of material, main effects of field centers, experiments and trials, a limited ability to replicate, and this is more serious in medicine. There's a possibility of an experiment by trial by treatment interaction. Uh, my personal opinion is this is likely more important in agriculture than in medicine, despite all of the hype that you may have heard about personalized medicine. But in both cases, modern, modest treatment differences can bring substantial long-term gains. So we're looking for small effects against a background of considerable noise. Here's a timeline of meta-analysis in medicine. Um, in the version I sent through earlier, I made a mistake here. I put, for some reason, I had a brainstorm. I put William Cochrane. Bill Cochrane is the Cochrane of Cochrane and Yates. Archie Cochrane, with an E at the end, is the Cochrane who published Effectiveness and Efficiency, random reflections on health services in which he bemoaned the fact that there wasn't really a way of combining information. 1976, Eugene Glass, I've already mentioned. 1985, Hedges and Olkin published their very influential book, Statistical Methods for Meta-Analysis, which covered also in detail Eugene Glass's um, effect size measure, but also other approaches. In 1986, De Simonian and Laird published their random effects meta-analysis approach, essentially using uh, Cochrane's Q statistic, the Cochrane in question there is not Archie Cochrane, but Bill without the E at the end of his name. Uh, and then in 1989, Enkin, Kiersa and Chalmers really produced a guide, to, uh, a first thorough compendium of meta-analysis in medicine when they had a guide to effective care in pregnancy and childhood, in which they had a number of surprises. They validated the fact that some particular Current treatments were valuable, but also exposed some as being harmful. So it was quite an interesting uh, and um, thought-provoking book. Uh, and in fact, it inspired Archie Cochran to say that one should do this for everyone, for every medical uh, specialty. And then in, in 1992, Ian Chalmers was appointed director at uh, the UK Cochrane Centre. Uh, um, by that time, the idea had been to, to promote uh, the, the synthesis of results 
throughout medicine by using volunteers and to brand it using Archie Cochrane's name. And the, set, the Cochrane collaboration was set up in 1993. In 1999, Hirotsu and Yamada um, suggested calculating indirect odds ratios, a form of what we now call network meta-analysis. And this is essentially uses the indirect comparison technique already known to people working in, in agriculture by the 1930s and 2000 onwards, increasing use of network meta-analysis and health technology assessment. Carl Pearson, by the way, who is sometimes mentioned as being the first um, meta-analysis, he was obsessed by correlation, so everything had to be expressed in a correlation. So when he had a two-by-two two table showing people who had been inoculated and not inoculated, and those who, came, those who came down with enteric fever and those who didn't, then he would transform that into a tetrachoric correlation coefficient by imagining there was a bivariate normal behind it. I often say the difference between statisticians and medics is that medics suffer from, suffer from dichotomania, give them a continuous measurement, and they instantly try and cut it in two, whereas statisticians suffer from continuitis. They always think, what's the tolerance distribution behind this binary outcome? Is it complementary log-log? Is it log-it? Is it probit or whatever? And of course, sometimes what the statistician is doing is just reversing what the medic has done. The medic has dichotomized the data, and the statistician then theorizes as to what it might have been before the dichotomy took place. However, there we are. Mantle-Hensel 1959 methods of analyzing a series of two by two tables, uh, also in a sense, a form of meta-analysis. And uh, network meta-analysis, uh, if you look at the term, then you'll find it's virtually unknown before the year 2000. But since then, it's also now reaching a large number per year. We're now at 5,000 per year. And also using the logarithmic graph on the right-hand side, it seems that we are in exponential territory. So conclusions. Why do we overlook the origins of meta-analysis? At least I'm claiming we do. Maybe we don't. Maybe you're all familiar with this, in which case I can only apologize. This is a speculation. We're all familiar with regression in its many forms. However, the form that students usually approach first is that of determining two unknowns, gradient and intercept, in an overdetermined linear si system. In fact, the student is more likely to encounter the single parameter problem as estimating the gradients only regression to the origin than estimating the intercept. But estimating a mean from a number of independent determinations is equivalent to estimating the treatment effects from a number of studies. It's a one parameter problem, it's an intercept problem. And the former is the simplest application of least squares. So in actual fact, least squares, which we think of as always as that regression thing, it's actually also meta-analysis and always has been. Lessons from the history of combining observations. The theory was originally developed in connection with astronomy, Gauss, Lejean de Laplace. It moved from astronomy into agriculture. Student, Wood and Stratton, Fisher, and then Yates and Cochrane were all essentially bringing ideas from astronomy into agriculture and then developing them further. The astronomers were then soon outdated. They were not aware of what was going on in agriculture. And already when Wood and Stratton applied techniques of astronomy to agriculture, they were behind students in what they were doing. It then moved into medical statistics via education, but the medical statisticians were often unaware of the history and reinvented what much that had already been better done in agriculture. In particular, I think network meta-analysis, really people should be made to sit down and read uh, <clears throat> some of the classical textbooks on design of experiments first before they start looking at that particular field. There was a forgetting between disciplines also within, uh, between disciplines and also within, and for my final conclusion is that greater interdisciplinary awareness will be valuable to mankind. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, so are there any questions? It, Guillaume says, I would be interested uh, in guessing on the next development of meta-analysis approaches, question mark. So what's the future, I guess? Um, well, possibly um, developing an idea of Don Rubin's that um, was proposed, I think, about 25 years ago. Um, he points out that really what you want to do in many cases when you're talking about science is you want to estimate what the perfect study will give you, whereas we tend to be obsessed with what the average study will give us. So you could regard it as being a regression problem if you have quality measures, in which case what you want to do, you might have measured um, studies with different degrees of quality, but if you find that the answers vary according to the quality, then maybe you can have a way of working out, well, what would the really perfect quality study show us? So that would be uh, 
I think I think in general, I mean, it's also applied to replication. We're too obsessed with what another study would show us. I don't want to know what another study would show us. I want to know what the truth is. Unless the other study is infinitely, if perfectly conducted and of infinite size, then part of the reason why it doesn't agree with what we have already is because it doesn't agree with the truth. What I want to know is I want to know what the truth is. And so replication per se is not really what the game is about. Great. Have you, do you think that, uh, Stephen, that like other fields are catching up with regards to, you know, meta-analysis? You know, I know that definitely like there's definitely some fields that are quite behind, like maybe like economics or um, even education. I guess education has caught up, hasn't it? Um, I don't know. I mean, the, there is a collaboration, the Campbell collaboration, which uh, is, was supposed to be doing for educational studies, what the Cochrane collaboration is doing for medicine. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think they've been sort of, I think my own feeling is I have, I have a paper called Overstating the Evidence, which um, looks at um, I think a particular problem that Cochrane tended to overlook. Cochrane was rightly, I think, obsessed with the problem of missing evidence, but they didn't really pay attention to the problem of evidence that wasn't actually there. Um, and what you found is you found for a number of meta-analyses that were carried out, people were counting the same data twice because they hadn't realized. You know, for example, um, a three-arm study, uh, the software was set up to do a two-arm study. So people didn't know how to put a three-arm study into it. So what they did was they just used one of the control arm twice. So they had two two two-arm studies out of a three-arm study. I mean, it's sort of depressing in a way because you have to say there must be some fundamental lacking of any statistical intuition which would cause people to ever think that this was an acceptable answer. I mean, you know, even if you didn't know what was the right thing algebraically, you should have a level of statistical intuition that says, well, it just can't be right. You know, just inventing data can't be a right way to do a, to do a meta-analysis. And yet you could find quite a few, um, I came across quite a few examples published in by Cochrane in which this particular thing had, had happened. Another problem, wow, was right. that you, another problem was that you could have a study which had reported early and then you had the long-term results that reported as well. And what people hadn't noticed was that the... Um, the early results were included in the long-term summary, so you got the same, the same data twice. A, a number of examples. Uh, also, the question of pooling, pooling different um, substances. When is this legitimate? When is it isn't? It depends what the question is. For example, if you want to, you want to, you can, can you could pool all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs together if you want to versus placebo. But what you have to understand is that if you find a significant effect and you believe that significant effect indicates something has happened, what you found is that at least one of the treatments is better than placebo. You've not found that every treatment is better than placebo. So there are circumstances under which for certain questions, pooling is okay. For certain other questions, that sort of pooling is not okay. And again, I think people hadn't really started to think about what questions they were trying to answer with the meta-analysis. Um, I had a paper from uh, from 2004 called Added Values, um, which suggested five questions that people might like to think about clinical trials. The first one was, was there an effect? Second was, what was the average effect for these patients? The third one, is the average effect the same for all patients? And the fourth one would be, uh, what is the average effect for particular subgroups? And the fifth one would be, what is the average effect for future patients? And these are different questions getting progressively more and more difficult and people tend to think that the answers to question one and question two must also be an answer to question five but this is not true I have a comment question from uh david who says um well two two davids actually but the last one says how to manage confirmation bias when it uh limit uh, lamentably creeps into <laughs> a meta-analysis well there are a number of ways it could occur confirmation bias because people are excluding studies that don't agree with what they think should happen or what exactly? I mean, the point is to a certain extent, meta-analysis is meant to guard against confirmation bias because it's supposed to be a formal way of combining results. Whereas a confirmation bias might lead you to subliminally discount particular results that you don't like. Whereas if you have all the results, 
then in that case, it should help you guard against it. But of course, it won't guard against it perfectly. Yeah, th thanks for that. No, I think um, that's exactly right. If we have all the results, then meta-analysis should get us closer to the truth. But uh, human beings, uh, not statisticians, of course, but most other human <laughs> beings do, do have something of an agenda and are often keen to demonstrate something in their published work. And when that yeah. happens, it, it yeah. might not just be a question of study selection. It, it, it could also be, I think, uh, other ways of uh, what you might call stat washing uh as the analog for greenwashing um and i just yeah, wonder how much that's, that's a good thing that's a good phrase i shall i shall plagiarize that at some stage <laughs> you're welcome um so if if this is uh, a problem that that does occur to statisticians uh, i mean it certainly occurs to those of us in psychiatry because we've got a lot of agendas i guess it would be fascinating to know how how it might be best detected and managed so thank you well thank you so much for the talk we really enjoyed it and i think it's a really okay. great addition to our series actually like it's such an interesting and pertinent topic and i mean we definitely have had so much interest so thank you so much for being here today and hopefully we'll see you again next year